listen, that some of you, many of you, are one thought away from a whole new level. Just, just one thought away from a new dimension, from you walking into new territory, from a radical, fresh start, a new beginning, a whole new experience for you, a, 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 a new identity, a new marriage, a new business, a, a new ministry, a new, like there, you are one thought away from where you are to where God wants you to be. Just, just one thought. And I don't know what that thought is for you today, but I've been praying for you all week that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you the lie that you have bought into, the, the thought that, that you need to grab, that needs to take root into your spirit. And so today in our text, you guys, we're actually, we've been in Exodus for eight weeks. In Exodus, the word Exodus means departure or going out and and it's this whole, it's a story of Moses and God delivering the Israelites from captivity and bondage and slavery from Egypt, and then their, their desert and wilderness experience. That's where we've been in that whole journey of Moses and the Israelites for these last eight weeks. But in our text today, we got a new book that I'm going to open up for you guys called the Book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. Now, Numbers begins with just that, a whole bunch of numbering. There's just a bunch of numbering. It's like, it's, it's the numbering of the tribes, and it's the assessing of who are these people that we have? Are they still here? Who's here? Who's, who are the leaders of all the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, and how many descendants do they have? And so it's called Numbers because it's, it's a numbering of all the tribes. It's an account of all the people of God. Now that's like the first like 12 chapters is all numbering the people and who's there. And it's a very intriguing reading when you're doing the one year Bible reading plan and you get to numbers chapters one, two, three, and four. And, and you're like, Lord, speak to me. Give me a word through this. And, but thank God, like every time, every day I get a, I get a proverb, a Psalm and new Testament. That's why I encourage you guys to do the one year Bible. Because there are some dry spots. Can I say that? Can I be okay with that? There are some, there are some begat, 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 begat stuff that you're like, you, gotta, you, you really got to extract. Uh, anyway, anyway. Okay, so we're gonna, our text begins in, in Numbers chapter 13. And, and they've assessed like the, the numbering of the tribes of Israel. But now, look what, Numbers chapter 13. The Lord says to Moses... Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. So God wants, is, he's the one, and very important for you to realize, God is the one who actually told Moses to not only number the people and get an accurate assessment of who you got here with you, but go check out where I'm sending you. I want you to explore. I don't want you to go in blind. I want you to go explore. Jump with me to verse 17. And it says, when Moses sent them, to explore the land of Canaan, he sent out 12 spies, one from each tribe. He said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak. I need, I need to assess what we're stepping into. Is, are there a lot? Are there a few of them? How many? What kind of land do they live on? Is it good or bad? He gives them a list of questions. He's like, what, what, what kind of towns do you live in? Are they walled? Are they fortified, unwalled? How is the soil? Is it fertile? Is it poor? Are the trees in it or not? Do your best even to bring back some fruit of the land. I want to taste test this thing, man. Before I jump into it, can I get a taste test? So Moses sends them with all these questions into this. So he's asking the right questions. And I wonder if, if, like Moses is humble enough to ask the questions to prepare him for something he has never received, for something he has never done, for a radical change, a new dimension. Listen, God does not want you to step into your next season foolishly. And I wonder if some of you are asking the right questions of what is ahead of you. I wonder if some of you are entering blind or if you're humble like Moses and if you're asking the right questions, you may want to write this down. Never assume that what's next is like where you've been. Are you with me today this morning, you guys? Never assume that what's next is like where you've been. See, some of you went into a new season, but you're still using the old strategies. Some of you went into a new season 
but you're using the old strategies and the incongruency is causing you to lose battles that you were built to win. Oh, I'm preaching so much better than you guys are responding again. Never assume that what's next is like where you've been. Never assume you can be married and act single. Okay? Never assume that, that having a baby won't change the whole dynamics of the marriage. So never assume that what you're stepping into next, that you can use the same strategies and the same habits and the same attitudes. You better be asking the right questions of the next season God is taking you into. You got to prepare. Every change of what's next affects everything that was. Every change of what's next. And Moses understands that a big part of leadership is thinking. It's thinking. And he knows you can't do good thinking with poor information. So side note, you better be careful on who's feeding you the information. <laughs> you, you better be careful on what sources you're going to to get you the information that's causing you to think accurately about where you're stepping into. Okay, let's, numbers, let's continue. Numbers chapter 13, verse 26. It says, they came back, these 12 spies, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed it, which I don't understand, by the way. I don't understand how, because Mo, Moses is a good leader. He's a really good leader. The best leader of probably of the Old Testament that we, like an amazing leader. But I just don't get, I don't understand how Moses could allow these 12 Spy, these 12 men to go get an accurate report to come and then to report the whole thing to everybody before he reported it, before he filtered it himself. You know, as a leader, I, I, I understand, like, I have to have a meeting with my team and with my department and with my pastors, and we got to get an accurate understanding of the situation and get our minds right and minds aligned and our vision aligned before we go and, and, and tell the rest of the community. So I don't understand why he allowed the report to be given w without him filtering that report. Side note on leadership. Okay, just a leadership side note there. I, I don't understand here. But here they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Man, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Here's the fruit, even. And then here comes the bud. It looks great. It's beautiful. God's taking us in a great direction. I can, I can almost taste it. Some of you, can, some of you are at the, at the verge at the, like the very verge of, of a breakthrough of your promise, of stepping into what is next. And this is where the Israelites are at. All the wandering, all the dreams, all what they've been dreaming for and talking about and their ancestors talking about, they're right there at the edge of the land of Canaan, about to step into everything that they had ever dreamed of. And it looks great, but it doesn't come without a price. But it's not perfect. But it's not easy. But, look what he says, but the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Enoch there, these giants. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession. Somebody say, take possession. Take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So here the nation is, the nation of Israel is now, because they're hearing the entire report. They're caught between two thoughts. The, one of my titles today of this message, I got a couple of them. One of them is caught between two thoughts. I wonder if today some of you are caught between two thoughts. The people of Israel had an opportunity to receive the gift, but they had focused on the giants that opposed them rather than the gift that God had given to them. And that happens to us all the time. There will always be a thought that God will bring us and God will deliver us. And there will always be a thought that the enemy will bring destruction. The enemy will take from us. Have you ever been caught between those two thoughts? Oh, I can. I will. I am. You're not. You won't. You can't. Come on, I'm talking to somebody who's caught between 
Two thoughts who's just one thought away from stepping into and possessing what God has already promised you and prepared for you. I believe there are many of you here today that are one thought away from, from everything that you dreamed of. Just one thought away and we're caught between the 10 spies that are speaking lies and Caleb and Joshua who are given a faith report of the future. When we get caught between two thoughts, here's some reasons why. Let me just expose this with you, okay? Why maybe you're caught, immobilized, you're buying into the wrong thoughts. Here it is. Number one, we let our mental self-image define us. Some of you are letting your mental, like for most of us, our self-image goes way back to our childhood. Unfortunately, some of us, or many of us, our beliefs are false. The beliefs we developed that, that remember as a kid going into that fun house and those mirrors that you would walk up to and they would like, they would make you all, all wide and all like all the funny looking and, and short and wide. It gave you a distorted image of yourself, right? Some of us grew up around all that negativity and it defined us. And today you often are looking through that lens of that funny mirror and you have a distorted image of yourself. You got this mental self image that's affecting the way you see yourself and think about yourself. Numbers chapter 13, look what it says. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can attack these people. They, we can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. We saw the Nephilim there, the, the descendants of Anak who came from the Nephilim, these giants. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. Let me time out right there. They didn't talk to these giants, not one time. They had no conversation with these giants. This was their perspective of who they were through the lens of who they were seeing. They were measuring themselves by, by looking at themselves through these giants' eyes and saying, we must look like these grasshoppers. Now, you may want to write this down. Make sure you include all the facts in your mental report. We, we like to exclude some of the facts. What I mean by all the facts don't leave out what God has done. Don't leave out what God has said. Don't leave out where God has taken you from. Don't leave out the miracles that he has done. Don't leave out the goodness of God, the provision of God. And sometimes when you're buying into the wrong thought and you're caught there, you're not taking all the facts into consideration. You're just looking with human eyes, assessing with human situation. And you need to take all the facts into consideration. See, Moses tells them, go spy out the land. Don't let them see you. Don't get caught. But they didn't get caught by their enemies. Check this out. They got caught by their insecurities. Wow, that's good. They got caught by a thought. And the thought was, we're not big enough. The thought was, we don't have enough. The thought was, we can't. They're bigger. And so now all of a sudden, they're dominated. Check this out. Not by their enemies, but they're dominated by a thought. Did you, did you know you can catch a thought? Like you can just catch it. You can just pick it up. How about, did you know you can catch faith? You can catch faith. You know you can catch fear? You can catch an attitude, right? There are some people that call you, right when you look at the caller ID, it just, you catch that attitude right away. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about? You don't even have to talk to them. You don't have to be around them, but you just look at the caller ID and it's, it's got you. You are caught by a thought. You just caught it because of this, this, the look and the read of their name. You know you can catch a dream. You can catch a, an idea. You can catch a vision. Do you like this church? How many of you like this church? Anyone like this church? Amen. Before there was a seat, there was a thought. Okay? So, so write it down like this. You catch whatever you're close to. So, so you're about to step into what God has pre prepared for you, but you're caught by a thought, your self-image, because of what you're close to. So write this down. One of the reasons why you're caught between these two thoughts is because we let the wrong people influence us. <laughs> if you catch what you're close to, then you need to be close to the right people. Some of you need to, to pull out your contacts in your phone like right now before I'm even done preaching. And some of you need to start deleting some stuff, blocking some stuff, unfollowing some stuff. Some of you guys need to clean up because you're catching 
what you're close to, and when you're scrolling through, you wonder why you're all of a sudden happy and then depressed. You got your day's going good, and then all of a sudden you're sad, or you're mad, or you're upset. I wonder what you're close to that you're catching that attitude from. Oh, some of you need to, you need to kind of watch out. You got to let the right people. The reason why you're caught between the two thoughts is you're letting the wrong people influence us. Numbers 13, here it continues. It says this. And they spread, these 10 spies, they spread among the Israelites a what? A bad report. Man, you got to be careful. Where do you get your reports from? Where do you get your news from? Where do you get your gossip from? Come on, gossip. Where you you got to be careful. Hopefully nowhere. Come on, somebody. I don't get a gossip from nowhere. You got to be careful where you're, because here they are. They spread. They spread. It spreads. Isn't it funny how, how negative news spreads really fast, doesn't it? It just spread. It just spread. It's this bad report. It spread about the land that they had experienced. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. So this whole nation now caught the wrong thought, and it made their faith Weak, and God had already given them the land. They, they could have had the land that God promised. In fact, the land was already theirs because the enemy cannot take what God has already given you. However, if, if he can attack your faith through weakening your immune system, your faith immune system that was supposed to filter out all those microscopic germs of discontent that will cause you to walk away from what God is calling you to walk into, although he can't take away the, the promise from you, if he can get your faith, if he can get to your thoughts, if he, can get, if he can get to that part of you that believes God, then he can disrupt something through what your eyes see or through what your ears hear. He can't take the promise from you, and he can't take the land from you, but if he can get you to believe something different, he can prevent you from walking in it. There are 10 spies telling bad reports, and two spies, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb is the only one we read, but Joshua, we hear in the narrative there, in Numbers chapter 13, he's one of the two that, that gave a good report of the land, telling a good report. Here's what's crazy. They saw the same thing. They, all 12 of them saw the same thing. They, they went to the same place. They assessed the same situation, but they interpreted it, check this out, from a different perspective. They translated what they saw and what they experienced from a different spirit. Are you with me today, you guys? Do you, I wonder, if, if you, do you ever feel outnumbered in your thought life? It's very often that that there are more voices against you doing what God wants you to do than for doing what God wants you to do. Like there was 10 voices that said, we can't, we won't, we'll never, and only two that said, and I find that that ratio is kind of accurate, even in, in my own life. I have, sometimes I feel outnumbered in my own life, and there's, even when things are going great, there could just be a couple of negative things, man. I got a Caleb in my mind telling me, we can we should. God can. God will. God is. And then I got these other 10 spies telling me, no, you can't. No, you won't. No, God won't. That's, that's not for you. Am I preaching to anybody today? Does anyone, else, uh, does anyone else battle between two thoughts, get caught between these, these two thoughts? And I wonder if anyone here is, is with me to, 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 get, to stay in the safety of what you know and what you're comfortable with of what you think you can manage or to trust God with greater territory, to trust God with a, with a greater enemy, with a new and greater level. We uh, let our, the wrong people influence us. Write this down. Here's the reason why we're caught between two thoughts. We let our past program us. We let our past program us, these negative experiences, maybe these hurtful words that were spoken over you and into you. Maybe these past mistakes that we've even committed and done ourselves, they're just, they're, they're programmed inside of us. For some, it comes from your family background. Some of you had unpleasable parents, angry parents, hurtful parents. No matter what you did, it wasn't good enough. Your past has become your programming. It's become your operating system. It's the reason why you get caught between two thoughts is because you're, you're still using programming from your past. 
Let's look at Numbers again, Numbers chapter 14. It says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. Here they go again. Come on, we've been reading this for eight weeks, you guys. If only we, like, or in the wilderness even would be better than this. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Look what they said. Our wives and our children are even going to be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back? Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to where we came from, back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. See, the problem is they didn't see themselves as children of God. They still saw themselves as slaves of Egypt. Here's, here's why we're programmed this way to continue. So the reason why you have a gravitational pull to the past things that you've been delivered from is because although maybe you're not doing those things and you're not there physically, your identity has never changed. Maybe your location changed, but your identity never changed from who you were in your past. And I feel sorry for these Israelites because they spent a lot of years, many years in generational bondage and slavery to shift, though, from thinking like a slave to thinking like a son of God. It's a big shift, and I feel sorry for them because, because they, they, they're in culture, they're indoctrinated, they have, they have programming, and it, it may even seem a little inauthentic for some of you to act in ways that you have, or to... Act like someone you've never been. Because all you've ever known up to this point of your life is slavery. All I've ever known is my bondage. And yet, I need to find my identity in something different and deeper than my past and my circumstances and my wounds and my mistakes and my resume. If I want to possess what God has prepared for me, then I need to change my identity. And for some of you, the reason why it's hard for you to think about yourself differently is because it does feel inauthentic. It does. How am I going to act like I was just smoking that stuff a month ago? I was just drinking like that. I was just talking to my kids like I was just still. I was just that, that's who I've been all my life. And now because I'm not in Egypt and I've just crossed over a Red Sea, I'm somehow supposed to be different than the generational things. And this is why you're caught, is because you have not bought in to the idea, to the thought that you are a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God, and you can't keep thinking of yourself and operating like you're in bondage still. It's not inauthentic. You just need to go deeper. You just need to find your identity in something deeper than your mistakes, something deeper than your past. It needs to go deeper to the very core of where God lives inside of you, your identity and your soul. It's who you are. And until you change your identity, you're going to continue to have a gravitational pull. It's going to continue to try to pull you back to the things that you think you are. You still think you are and believe you are. We let the past program us. So we're caught between two thoughts today. Here's another one. Here's we're caught between two thoughts because we let the devil accuse us. We just let him. We just let him. We just tolerate that dumb devil speaking his lies. A war is raging all around you, and you may not even be aware of it, but there's a battle in your mind happening. There's a battle in your mind. Before the battle, before the giants that this next season has for you, because there are new enemies in the new territory, there is new enemies for you and new battles you need to fight. But the first battle you need to win is the battle in your mind. You need, to, you need to get unstuck between these two thoughts. It's a battle of your mind. The devil's number one target is your thoughts. He knows that if he can get you to believe his lies, he'll be able to control and manipulate your life. You know, the devil is a thief, right? He's a thief. He can't take your promise, so here's what he wants to do. He wants to steal it through your thoughts. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. You know, and, and that's what a thief does. That's what the thieves do that. That's what thieves do. They're going to steal. They're going to kill. They're going to destroy. That's what his MO is. He was, he's coming to rob from you. But I love what Proverbs chapter 6 says. Proverbs 6, verse 30 and 31. 
It says people don't despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger. I mean, you can't judge a thief. He's a thief. That's what he does. He's a, he's a thief when he's starving. A thief is just a thief. a thief. You know, the enemy is a thief, and you can't blame him for trying to steal with what you have. But check this out. Check out this next verse, verse 31. Yet if he is what? Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold. So today we came into this service to catch a thief. Come on, somebody. We're going to catch a thief today. And, 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 and let him know, you got to give me my joy back. You got to give me my wisdom back. You got to give me my gifts back. You got to give me my kids back. You got to give me my, my, the joy of my salvation. And you got to restore sevenfold. This time to pay up. We came to catch a thief in Jesus' name. So how do you catch a thief that lives in your mind? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. This is why I can't understand why Moses allows these people to just speak, setting themselves up against the knowledge of God. Why I don't understand we allow these thoughts to rule and to reign and exist in our minds without identifying and capturing them. Why do we stay stuck between these two thoughts? Why do we allow the 10 spies to continue to rent space in our minds? Why? He says we demolish every argument, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. I'm going to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So catch this. Here's the thought that you need to catch. God is for you. More than the world is against you, God is for you. You need to kick those 10 spies out of your head and start listening to Caleb today. You can, you will, you are. God is, God will, God can. Amen, somebody? You're just one thought away. You're just one thought away from you going to another dimension, a whole new level. One thought away. But you're caught between two thoughts. And I'm just here today to get you to think just one thing differently. And I hope that's, that's my goal today. Just one thing you're going to think differently than the way you came in. Just one area that you're caught in, that you're stuck in, that those lies are going to be taken captive, kicked out, and you're going to buy into that one thought, that one thought that God wants you to receive to you to step into a next dimension. Here, let me give you some truths here. Number one, how do you possess this promise that God has prepared for you? Number one, everything begins as a thought. Everything begins with a thought. So the things you're doing well and the things you're doing not so well, they're fueled by your thinking. That happens first. So in other words, don't try to change your behavior. Change your thinking. And your behavior will follow. So everything begins first with your thoughts. Adultery doesn't start without a thought. Hate doesn't start without a thought. Greed doesn't start. Debt doesn't start without a thought. On the other hand, life change begins with a thought. Are you with me? Just one thought. It begins. To, the, the growth and new life that God has for you begins with a thought. Romans 12 and 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to give you a new way to think before you step into the new dimension he's calling you into. Before you step into that promise, you got to start thinking better. you got to start thinking differently. Okay? Everything begins with a thought. Number two, what we think determines how we believe. What we think determines how we believe. Did you realize that your mind can affect your faith? Can affect how you operate in faith? You're going to speak, act, and react like the person you think you are. So you may be blaming it on your spouse or your teachers or your neighbors, or the economy, but trust me, those things aren't making you feel or believe any certain way. It's your response to those things. Your thought life in response to those things are determining how you're even feeling right now. It's how you're thinking about those things, because truth be known, everybody lives through the same situations. We've all lived through the same economy, the same quarantine, the same challenges, the same gas prices, 
Just some of you are flipping your lid about it, and some of us are trusting God with it. Can I, you know what I'm saying? Some of you are, are freaking out about everything, and some of us have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Okay? What's the difference? It's how you're thinking. Determines how you're believing, which is why I think some of you ought to take me up on this challenge, okay? And I'm not getting legalistic at all. Some of you need to get off of social media for like, for like a month. Okay, for some of you, just a week. Try a week. Let me give you just one week. One week, get off social, in, in, in all kinds of media. Get off the TV. Get off the news that's feeding you, the channels and stuff. Just get off of all that stuff because how you think is determining your faith and you're consuming stuff that's affecting your thought life and you wonder why you don't have the faith to believe God to do what he's called you to do and you're caught between the two. And you keep getting caught between, I know I should, but what if this? And you keep getting caught, and you wonder why. And you're consuming things that are affecting your thoughts that are determining how you believe. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Beautiful scriptures. Some of you need to commit this to memory or put it somewhere in your house. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. That's the, only, that's the only people that deserve any space in your mind. If there are any other spies, kick them out. Think on only those things. And so I, if I were you, I'd go over that list right there. And anything that you are consuming that is influencing your thought life that does not meet the standard of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, kick them out. Kick, kick the channel out, block it, delete it, whatever you got to do, because he says, if you do these, check, out, check it out, and the God of peace will be with you. If you want the peace of God in your life, then you need to, you need to be careful what you're thinking and allowing in your thought life, okay? So we're going to, what we think determines what we believe. Number three, our thoughts determine our destiny. It's your thought life. It's not your, it's not your education. It's not your intellect. It's, not, it's none of that stuff. Listen, before it's all that, before it is all of that, it is your thoughts that are determining your destiny. Someone once said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a lifestyle. Sow a lifestyle, reap your destiny. If you don't like where you're going in life, if some of you are like, I just don't like where I'm going, change your thought. Change your thinking. Let me say it this way. You are today where your thoughts have brought you. And you will be tomorrow where your thoughts have taken you. So if you don't like where you're going or where you're at, change what you're thinking about. That's it. That's where it begins. Before, before anything else, you need to change what you are thinking about. Numbers chapter 14 tells the the destiny that was shaped by the infiltration of the thought that the Israelites were caught between and, and the sad shift that they could have stepped into the promise, but they got discipline instead. Look what it says, Romans chapter 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will these wicked community grumble against me? How long will they stay stuck between and caught between these two thoughts? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. So the very thing that they were afraid of, God says, I'm going to give you. The very thing that they didn't trust God for, God says, fine then, I'll give it to you according to your faith. It'll be done to you. Whether it's a little bit of faith that you didn't have or a lot of faith, God said, according to the faith that you had, I'm going to do that for you. Is that how much you trust me? Fine. That's what's going to happen. In the wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you 20 years old or more who was counted in the census and who was grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. 
But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. Until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land. The 12 spies went 40 days into the land of Canaan, and they came back after 40 days. You will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness. Here they will die. No one says amen to that, right? <laughs> Here's the, your thoughts determine your destiny. Listen, they didn't get caught by the giants. They didn't get caught by the enemy. They got caught by their thought when God had already given it to them. And God has already prepared for you the business that, that you've been dreaming about, the marriage you've been dreaming about, the ministry you've been dreaming about, the health, the kid. Like he's already prepared it for you, yet you're still caught between two thoughts. And your thoughts, not God's desire, not God's ability, not God's power, but your thoughts are going to determine your destiny. If you see yourself a loser, you're going you're gonna to end up acting in large part like a loser. If you see yourself like a victim, you're going to tend to let people victimize you. On the other hand, if you see yourself as a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, set free, an overcomer, fully healed, protected by angels, first and not last, above and not beneath, you will walk in the direction that your thoughts are pointed. Some of you are like, well, that sounds like positive thinking mumbo jumbo, right? Right? No, it's all over your Bible. Romans chapter 8. Look at this. Those who are dominated by the simple nature, here's what they do. They think about simple things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, they think about things that please the Spirit. We've got discipline in our thought life. If your simple nature controls your mind, then you'll continue to reap death and destruction in your life. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, then you will have life in peace. Our thoughts determine our destiny, and you're one thought away, you're one thought away from entering into a whole new level. Here's number four, and I want to just close with a few final thoughts. Number four, we can choose a different thought. You can choose it. Do you know you can choose your thoughts? You're not, you're not subject to your own thought life and thinking. You can choose what thoughts to hold and what thoughts to take captive and what thoughts to evict. You can choose a different thought. You got a choice to make. You can stay caught. Listen, even your choice of indifference, of staying caught in between the two is a choice, but you need to choose a thought. Numbers 14, 24 tells us, because my servant Caleb, God says, has a different spirit, you can choose a different thought. You can choose a different perspective. You can choose a different spirit. He says, because he has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. You can choose a different thought. Some of you are going to go into work this coming week and people are going to notice the difference inside of you. They're going to notice that you chose a different thought. They're going to say, what in the world happened to you? And you're going to tell them, I was reminded of who my God is. I was reminded of who I am. I was reminded of what God has done, that he's always been faithful, and he's got me, and he's got this, like Pastor Todd said at night of worship, that my God is for me. And I'm telling you, when you do that, the scales begin to tip in your mind. When you remember who God is, and you choose a different thought, the scales begin to tip, and God becomes bigger, and your problems become smaller. Hebrews chapter 3 says it like this. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And look what he says, the author of Hebrews. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was God angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? 
So we see then that they were not able to enter. Look at it. Because of their unbelief. And I believe the thought that you're caught between has to do with your faith more than you think it does. So here's the final question we're, gonna, we're just going to sit with today, and God's going to bring revelation. Where, where is unbelief preventing you from receiving what God has already prepared for you? Okay, let me just, I, I'm a, I, Holy Spirit, help me, help me, that you would bring revelation, that you would bring insight, that you would reveal these areas. Where is unbelief preventing you from receiving what God has already prepared for you? Can we just pray? Can I just pray that over you and for God just to bring some insight, revelation? There's one, one, one area, one area of belief, one thought. God, right now, with every head bowed and eye closed, God, right now, I pray for your Holy Spirit to reveal where we're caught between two thoughts. Caught, a thought of negativity and defeat and victimization and the thought of victory, and power, and vision, faith. God, forgive us for limiting you and what you could do in our life and through our life because of our unbelief. Today, God, we choose. We choose a different spirit, a different perspective, and a different thought. It could be the same situation I'm facing tomorrow, but I'm facing it differently. I got a different spirit today, a different perspective today, a different thought today. I am above it, not under it. I am over it, not a victim to it. God, change my thought. This one thought, this one thought, change it, God, right now. With every head bowed and eye closed, some of you are here today and